Good afternoon, everybody. Um, very warm welcome here this afternoon. Uh, my name's Dorothy Meal. I'm Vice Principal and Head of the College of Humanities and Social Sciences, and Health and Social Sciences is one of the schools in, in this college. Um, it's an absolute pleasure to see so many people here today, and I know that Tonks is really grateful for all of those people who have come from all different aspects of her professional and personal life to, to be here to support her in her inaugural today. It's lovely to see colleagues from not only within nursing and health and social science, but also from all across the university, co-authors, students, former students, friends. So thank you all for coming today, and I'm sure Tonks appreciates it. Um, we're going to have the lecture followed by a reception outside, and you're all very, very welcome to come to that reception and, and to have a bit more of an informal mix and get to, to know each other or renew acquaintances. Um, I just want to say a few very brief words as a, as a welcome and an introduction. I'm sure you all know Tonks probably better than I do, but I, I still want to go through a little bit of uh, biographical history because I think it's, it's helpful for those of you who know her perhaps from some aspects of her life, but not from the whole range of things that she's done. She holds a first class, first degree in social science from City University in London and alongside a qualification she took at that stage as a state registered nurse. But then since she's come to Edinburgh, she originally arrived to do work in the Department of Psychology before being appointed as a clinical tutor in nursing studies and then a lecturer and senior lecturer. And in her time here, she's also taken a master's in nursing education and qualified as a registered nurse teacher. She's also pursued her interests in teaching and learning through membership of the Institute of Learning and teaching in higher education, and then in 2009 became a fellow of the Higher Education Academy. As well as all her roles and responsibilities within nursing over the years, um, she's held many positions advising and steering on both educational and professional developments outside the university. Uh, she was appointed to her chair, which is the Chair of Student Learning in Nurse Education, in 2012. Her research over the years has a, covered a whole range of fields uh, related to uh, many aspects of, of nursing, but more recently her research relates to understanding cancer care, survivorship, pain management, the acquisition and extension of professional and clinical skills, clinical decision making and stress in nursing. So a phenomenal range of experience and uh, achievement both in teaching and in research. But of course, one of the things that the pr Promotions Committee was most impressed by was the reputation she has as a nurse educator. Seen, now that's been seen in uh, the publication with Margaret Alexander and Phyllis Runciman of the three editions of her major nursing textbook that most students know as the Bible. And this is a, a book that's been used internationally. But her prowess as a nurse educator hasn't only been recognised through these publications, but also by the many generations of students that she's taught here in Edinburgh, uh, and formally by within the school, within the university, by the award of the the very first Students Association Teaching Award for overall teaching commitment in 2009. So I think we're all we all recognise her excellence in nurse education. And I think we're all looking forward to hearing a little bit about the personal journey that's brought her here. So, Tonks, welcome. Um, it's a great pleasure to see you all here. Um, I've been looking forward to this, but not entirely with pleasure the whole time. It's been a bit daunting. And I was uncertain how to give my presentation. And you can see from my title, that I was rather greedy on the alliterations. But I'd like to think that what I am going to talk about reflects passions, privileges, pains and purpose. And if you look round my first slide, I hope it reflects my love of knowledge, my love of clinical practice, the students and the students' success in their graduation. And it's all for the care of patients in whatever setting. So that was really what I wanted to talk to you about this afternoon. And as I said in my abstract, it comes a little bit more from the heart than the head, perhaps. But I've never given an inaugural before, and I was a little bit daunted. And I thought, well, I will have to seek advice. 
and I read round and I spoke to people. But I found this, and it said, it is one of the first duties of a professor in any subject to exaggerate a little both the importance of the subject and his own place in it. <laughs> and I have to say, you cannot exaggerate the importance of nursing, but it is very easy to exaggerate my place in it. But I liked the quote, even though it was his and not her. Um, but I did ask other people. Uh, one of the wisest bits of advice I got was from a good colleague and friend, uh, Professor Roger Watson from Hull. And he had done an inaugural and I valued his advice. And he said, you want to have a good beginning, a good end, and they should be close together. <laughs> and, and I don't think I'll achieve that. But I also sought advice from another good colleague, and that was um, Professor Philip Derbyshire from Mon Monash University in Australia. And he said, just be passionate. Be passionate about what you want to be passionate about. And I sort of thought, right. And he said, tackle the crises. I thought, oh, dear. Um, but he really was saying, as so many others have, say what you want to communicate in terms of what really uh, inspires you in your career. And it does seem now quite a long career. So um, it is a passion for nursing and nurse education. And I do have a career credo. And I think this idea of a credo probably doesn't sound very British, but I do have one. And I have it at the head of my curriculum vitae because I sort of feel I need to say at the outset what really is important to me. And I hope you can bear with it because it may sound a tiny bit pious. Um, but my aim and passion in my role at the University of Edinburgh is to equip our nursing students with the critical ability to understand and work in the reality of a complex and dynamic systems of healthcare provision in the 21st century. And it is complex and it is dynamic and it's not always easy. But that doesn't seem to have a great deal about care in it. So whilst preparing nurses for leadership, research, decision-making roles, the heart of the degree programmes is the primacy of compassion and respect for people in their care. And the last part of this rather travelling <coughs> sentence is important because it is so important to understand their health needs, their social context and absolutely primarily their unique human responses to the experiences of health and illness. And to me, this is what my career has been about and what I feel about nursing. So where did this all begin? I grew up in a very medical family, and I thought that was normal. I thought everybody had medical families. And although I'm biased, I think I had two amazing doctors as parents. My father was the epitome of dedication, not always to the amusement of my mother, because he would not take his half day and insisted that his patients phone him even if he was not on call. Um, my mother was an anaesthetist and uh, a GP, and uh, she had an amazing ability to diagnose. I don't know how she did it, but she always seemed to be able to diagnose. But what I value most from my mother is she taught me to be resilient in tough times. And she taught me that the importance of a sense of humor and the importance of smiling. Simple things, but they have stayed with me. Um, I also have two wonderful sisters who were also nurses and nurses at Bart's, my for, uh, initial hospital. And I have one wonderful brother who was not a nurse and really was not at all medical and a slight disappointment in that respect. But, uh, <laughs> but I love him to bits. Um, so what are my early passions? The sea, swimming, and a great love for the county of Dorset. And this is just to soften you all up. Um, this is me, age three, on the beach at Lyme Regis. And I can remember that photograph very well and those sand shoes and that hat. Um, but it was when I was three, I met members of my other family, my God family. And it's great pleasure to have my God brother here t t this evening. Um, and so I took great passion for Dorset and still love to go there and have walks and stay with my God family when I can. And then by the time I was eight years old, I was deeply immersed in the Red Cross. Uh, this was a passion of my father's and he had us join the Red Cross very early on where I learned about mother craft, home nursing, and first aid. And I don't know where Alison is, but Alison, who was also a member of the Junior Red Cross, will know our oath of allegiance, <laughs> never to be forgotten and oft recited. But it was 
as you see, is a junior member of the British Red Cross Society, promised to serve God, Queen and Country, and join with others all over the world to help the sick and suffering. And I think that's such a wonderful statement, and it's in my brain forever, because I learnt it so early in life. Um, as some of my friends know, I'm perhaps not the best traveller in the world, but I think the world comes to me with all the wonderful international students to come to this university. So I can join with others all over the world without having to go too far. Um, but, and those were some of uh, my badges, but I haven't got there my grand proficiency, for which I am still very proud, as is Alison over there. So other passions as I was growing up, um, and these come from my school days and again my mother. I had a love of acting. I flirted with Rada for a little while, but perhaps not. And this picture image on the left depicts um, the miracle worker in which I played the part of Annie Sullivan. Um, and it's the story of Helen Keller, the deaf, blind, mute girl and her amazing life. But doing acting taught me about the early understanding of empathy, to get inside someone else's persona, to be someone else for a while and play a part and understand the other. So I think acting is a good thing for people to do in their school days and I did enjoy it. On the right is another great passion of my school days, lacrosse. None of this hockey. Lacrosse was a wonderful game and even looking at that makes me feel the, the buzz of this game. And uh, I captained various, captained various teams and for a short while played lacrosse for the east of England. And it taught me a great deal about leadership, about teamwork, and I learnt how not to hog the ball, because I did tend to. When you play centre, you can go anywhere you like with the ball, and I did. But team games are important for leadership and teamwork. So I look back on these things and see them as having great value to how I was in later life. And at the bottom is the flat racing. And this was a passion of my mother's. And we used to go flat racing at Newbury and Newmarket and, and Ascot and other places. But it really let me see the joy of winning, the real joy of winning, and also about how to lose graciously and gracefully, and nothing loses more gracefully and graciously than a horse. Um, and they were great fun. So, and then by the time I was 17, 18, I was getting ready to have my career in nursing. All my life it had been known that I was going to do nursing, although there were times when people said, why don't you do medicine? But no, I stuck with the nursing. And I went to Barts to do the conventional state registration three-year nursing program but I was met by Winifred Hector and some of you may know or have heard of Winifred Hector and she was the principal tutor at Barts and 10 years after Edinburgh had set up a nursing degree program Barts did the same under the guidance of Winifred Hector in the bottom right photograph and she set up the degree course and when I joined with my five other friends I'm centre back um, it had been going for three years. And this, I have to say, was an amazing programme. I don't know about student satisfaction surveys and the National Satisfaction Survey. I think sometimes you have to wait 10, 20, even 30 years before you look back on your degree programme and realise how wonderful it was. And the degree programme at Barts and at the City University was superb. And when my students think they're working far too hard, I remind them of what I had to do as an undergraduate, which makes what they have to do pale into insignificance. <laughs> but uh, they don't really believe me, but it is true. And Winfred Hector wrote the book Medicine for Nurses, which was then a key text for nurses. And if I can just draw your attention to the this, this slide of the Barts, I look at that photograph and my memories are of wonderful things of taking patients in their beds, out of the wards, along the corridor, down the lift, out into the square that you can see with the fountain. And for the first time for many patients for many weeks, they would get the sun on their faces and the breeze blowing through the plane trees. And it had more therapeutic value than all the things we were fussing over in the ward, was to get them out into the Bart Square for a couple of hours on a sunny summer afternoon. But it was a very good programme and I learnt so much about the social sciences, about the medical sciences. I suppose I really learnt about 
to be more sophisticated, the ontology of care and the epistemology of nursing with the medical and social sciences. Um, and really what I want to say is never had I learnt so much about everything I always wanted to know. When I qualified, I was able to choose which ward at Barts I would like to staff in. Poor students in their final years thinking, when, when am I going to get my job and will I get it? And I was thinking, now which ward shall I pick? Um, but that was just considered the norm and, and of course it's only now I realise how fortunate I was. Um, but I, I had the joy of, of working at Barts for some time and I began to realise how much I enjoyed teaching the students that came to the ward and I loved teaching them at the bedside and I loved taking them with me when I was doing things and having, as I still say to the students, an instant slave. Um, but it was just nice to have them, to work with them and to teach them and I really realised that I rather liked telling people what I knew which perhaps is not such a thing to be proud of, but I did enjoy that. So I had happy times at Barts, but then I made two unusual decisions. I made the decision to take up a post in research, and I took up that post at Edinburgh University. So my second decision was to move to Edinburgh, and I think people like Peter can never understand how I did it, because I've never moved again since. can't see Peter but he always wondered how I ever managed to move them first time. But when you come to Edinburgh, as I did for my interview, I suddenly realised that this was a place that was too beautiful to not take up and, and enjoy. And all these years later, I'm not saying exactly how long, um, I am still here and it, it's sometimes hard to believe. Right, so I had new pastures and new decisions to move to Edinburgh University and undertake research in the Department of Psychology. And this was with Dr. Peter Wright and Rosemary Crow, who was then a lecturer in nursing studies. And it was probably the best decision I could have made. I want to thank, I can't see Peter. There you are, Peter. I want to thank Peter and Rosemary, who's not here t this evening, so very much for all I was taught about the business of research. Research as an everyday practice activity. It also made me realise how amazing my undergraduate content had been at the City University and that the applied statistics and the theoretical statistics and the computer studies had been so worthwhile. And there was a time when I actually could write a Fortran computer program, except I always called it Fort Trial, which was actually an analgesic at the time, um, which showed where my real heart was. But um, it also taught me the importance of underpinning our practice and our interventions with the best evidence. And it also was the excitement of research findings, the real adventure of generating new knowledge. And the research that we were doing at the time was looking at maternal and infant behaviour in the development of feeding behaviour and the influences the child's behaviour and the mother's behaviour could have on the feeding behaviour in relation to obesity and infancy, which at the time was quite a concern. So they were, they were happy days. Um, and then, after the grant, which was from the Scottish Home and Health Department at the time, uh, was completed, I found myself immediately lured back into nursing. And there was some advice that why would I want to do this? Surely now you've done all this research, surely you want to take up a research career. And it wasn't that I didn't really enjoy and love the research, but I needed to get back to the nursing. So I returned to nursing and uh, was then, after two or three years, asked by Professor Annie Ouchel, who was then the head of nursing studies, if I would like to apply for a post in the department. I had taught the students whilst I'd been doing research. Rosemary Crow didn't miss a trick and wheeled me in for tutorials and teach them about research and take some psychology sessions with the undergraduate students then. Um, but I felt reluctant to take up a lecturer's post straight away. So I took the post, after applying, as a clinical teacher, which of course the prime role was to teach clinically. And I really loved that. It made me have to really focus on how students learn, the importance of the content that we're giving them to learn, to make them understand and prioritise. But probably the most important thing it did, I had to put my money where my mouth was. 
so I had to practice what I taught. It was easy to talk about it, but you had to translate it and do it. And nothing was more rewarding, and nothing is more rewarding, than teaching the students as they learn to become the best nurses and help them achieve all their aspirations to be so. But I also taught theoretically and actually loved that just as much. So I need to do both, um, I think is the way I would put it. So teaching clinically and teaching theoretically are synergistic and symbiotic and everything else. Um, and as my academic career has moved in to become a lecturer and later a senior lecturer, this passion to teach clinically alongside the more theoretical lectures and academic roles never left me as a passion and a privilege. And this is probably where I want to talk about my passion for the clinical part of teaching. The direct teaching of evidence-based skilled care within the clinical setting is where this intellectual content of the discipline of nursing must be related to the clinical reality of caring, competent and safe practice. And I believe this is critical to the quality of our nurses. And in 1871, Florence Nightingale said, theory without practice is ruinous to nurses. And I thank Margaret for that. And, and Adam, who was here, um, that was a photograph taken on one of the wards in the Royal Infirmary for all this, the service staff that I worked with. Um, and indeed, the presence, I believe, of the academic in practice gives clinical credibility, currency, and provides invaluable insights into the organisation of healthcare. It forges those essential links fosters collaborative working and mutual respect with the service members of the profession for which the majority of our students are being prepared. And at this point, I just want to thank from the bottom of my heart all the service colleagues I have worked with and joined with over the years I've been in nursing studies. They have always made me feel welcome. They've always shared with me their joys and their disappointments, their challenges, the, the awful days, the wonderful days. And um, they've always made me feel that I can be part of the team when I arrived. They never seemed to mind when I arrived at rather peculiar hours and, uh, and would always support the learning that we were all trying to do for our students. So, um, and I know there's some here today. Um, I can't pick you all out, but I just really do appreciate everything that um, the service staff have given to our students and to me personally over the years. We could not prepare our students without you. 50% is practice-based and we couldn't do it without the service staff. And I, I want that message to get across. Okay, another passion. Well, it's not always a passion, but the outcome is nice. And I, I wanted just to talk a little bit about the writing for nurses over the years. Really, just another chance to say thank you to various people. Uh, the bottom, the Journal of Social and Clinical Psychology that you can see, that was my very first publication. And that was in the second year at the City University from the course on experimental psychology. And that was quite tough. Uh, Donna would appreciate experimental psychology. And, uh, and we did an experiment on interfering variables and learning. And Professor Peter Herriot, who was head of social sciences at the time, uh, persuaded us that we must, there was a group of us, that we must publish. And it was such a good thing to, to learn to publish early on. And it's something I do try to encourage in our students when they write these excellent course papers to translate it into a publication. And it's a real joy and privilege to do that with the students. Um, and then top on the left, Outchill Psychology for Nurses. And I owe such a, uh, a debt of thanks to Annie Outchill, who was perhaps somebody who was n as close to a mentor than perhaps I ever had as such, and to Helen Sinclair, who's here today, because both of them, when I was a very new clinical tutor stroke lecturer, said, come on, you're going to do the seventh edition of Outchill Psychology for Nurses, and you can write this chapter and that chapter. And I thought, oh, well, so I did. Um, <laughs> And I realized how much I enjoyed it. And I enjoyed the product. And I enjoyed seeing it being used and read and referred to. 
And that was a few years ago now, but it was my first foray into writing, and I'm hugely grateful to Helen and Annie Atchell for taking me on that step. And then um, I'd like to go to the other side, to pathophysiology, homeostasis, and nursing. And although he's not here, a huge debt of gratitude to Roger Watson. Um, he taught me, he taught me many things, but one of them was the seat of the pants to the seat of the chair, Tonks, and you get it done. And, that's, and, and that is Roger, and I learned that, and I would even think physically, seat of the pants, seat of the chair, and to write. And we wrote this, um, this text for, for student nurses, uh, really by remote control, because he at that time had moved to Hull and then Sheffield. Um, but he also, what I owe to Roger was, he used to say, you just dare to be different, Tonks, even if I don't agree with you. And he often didn't, but we have a good relationship, and I owe him a great deal. But then I move on to the three editions of nursing practice. And uh, I don't know how to thank Margaret Alexander, Professor Margaret Alexander and Dr. Phil Runtzman for our over 20 years of doing these three editions. It was, it was a joy and, and we had such fun and such laughter. We learned so much and I learned so much from both of them. I, I owe them such a debt of gratitude. And if I can edit anything, I owe it to both of them. And, uh, and they tolerated so well my clinical preoccupation uh, and what we brought different things to the textbooks. And we just were a good team, weren't we? And I still miss it, even though there had to come a time when, when I think you were allowed to stop. You know? <laughs> but, um, but it has been a real privilege that this text has proved so popular and to, to be referred to as the Bible, because when we did the first edition, we had no idea we had no idea if it would work or not. And we did it from scratch because it was the first textbook that was truly British, not an adaptation of an American text. Um, so thank you. And then just to look at perspectives on cancer care, the most recent publication, and that I want to thank Anne McQueen. Anne McQueen, who was my guiding light when I started in nursing studies with her meticulous attention to detail, which I was determined to do the same. And. Uh, she and I worked quite a lot on cancer care and sh shared that same interest and pursued research in this field and then decided to do this reader on perspectives in cancer care. But again, with this text and with nursing practice, a huge debt of gratitude to all the contributors and the contributors that came forward for both nursing practice and for perspectives on cancer care came from the service side. They were people I had seen in practice who had admired so much um, Shan is here, Gillian is here, so many of you, and it was just a, such a privilege to have your expertise and to have it in the text and for you to agree to contribute to these books. And I don't forget these things. And then last, just to look at some of the journal publications and thank all the, the co-authors that have written with me, um, particularly the students, and I've pulled out the nursing standard on bath time because that was an, uh, an article written with one of my second year students at the time called Learning to Nurse, Reflecting on Bathing a Patient. Simple, caring, essential part of nursing, but much more complex than people might think. And then the others, the Journal of Clinical Nursing, which again at that time uh, Roger Watson was editing and has moved on now to the Journal of Advanced Nursing, and many other people, my colleagues, Graham particularly, who I've written with, and Graham Smith, and um, other members of staff who I've written with, former students and other colleagues, and have also had the privilege of writing with a friend who was also a patient, who allowed me to share her journey of um, identifying that she had multiple sclerosis so that we could write about it as a shared experience. And that was a huge privilege to write with a friend who was also a patient. So that's my writing for nurses. So, so to move on to nursing as a privilege. Now, I feel badly because Nicola, where's Nicola White? I am reading from the text and I know you said not to do this, but sometimes you need to have the quotes there. Uh, a patient is the most important person in our hospital. He is not an interruption to our work. He is the purpose of it. He is not an outsider. He is part of it. We are not doing a favour by serving him. He is doing us a favour by giving us an opportunity to do so. And you can see that is from Mahatma Gandhi. 
And for hospital, you could substitute any care setting, community, respite, hospice. And I thought this was a wonderful quotation. And so it is a privilege to be a nurse. And I sometimes wonder if that has been forgotten in the hurly-burly of everyday life of patient care at the minute. When I was a, a child and growing up and becoming a nurse, the word vocation and dedication was almost synonymous with nursing. And perhaps th today everything is so fast-paced, there is so much more we can do, that perhaps we don't have the time to reflect upon the privilege of being a nurse. But the one thing I always like to believe is that however difficult a day you've had, and we've all had difficult days as nursing, when everything goes pear-shaped at about 11 o'clock, even when eventually you get home, you know that you have done something worthwhile. And I think we should never forget that. We are very privileged to have a, a job, whether it's in education or the practice of nursing, that is so worthwhile. And then it is a privilege to teach nursing and to help students learn. And I do mean this. And I, I think one of the things I enjoy if I can in any small way, is to act as a catalyst in some small way for the aspiration of student learners, to bring out the best in them and to see how they can flourish. And it, it is a real privilege to be able to do that. And I seem to have done it for a long, long time now, but every new intake of students is just as fascinating and Shouldn't, I shouldn't say nice things because they're sitting here and, they're, um, and I don't say this to them, to have students who themselves inspire, but the students do inspire. Um, I don't tell them too often and I hope the ones that are here won't tell them that I've said this, but they, they do inspire and, and they come up with new ideas and help us, us staff think in new ways and, uh, and it, is a, it is a privilege. And it is a privilege to teach nursing at the University of Edinburgh. Now, we often say this at various events and days about Edinburgh and nursing, but it is important to repeat it, that Edinburgh was the first university in the United Kingdom to pioneer higher education for those people, essentially women at the time, who desired to nurse, wanted to nurse, but also to stretch their intellect and to foster critical inquiry into this practice discipline. And I do think it's something that the University of Edinburgh should be so proud of allowing what was then essentially women to do and allow nurses to sit at the academic table. And now we take it more for granted that it's an academic discipline. But back in the mid-50s and into the early 60s, it wasn't. And it was considered peculiar. And it was a brave move of Edinburgh to do. Um, and I'm proud to be here now, even though I started at Barts. And then the other privilege is, of course, the research excellence. And I really sometimes can't believe how fortunate we are to be in Edinburgh, where there is this amazing research going on round about. Now, I don't often use particle physics in my nursing lectures, but even I can see the fascination of the Higgs boson particle and would use it if it was relevant, and it one might be. But to have the Royal Observatory here doing all this amazing work and then we have the amazing work done on stem cell research. And I love using this and using local research teams when I'm talking about regenerative medicine and the use of stem cells to perhaps manage chronic illnesses and restore tissue to its former state. And I'm also very fond of Dolly the sheep. Um, and uh, and he, she rotates in Chambers Street Museum. Um, but also, there is many other fields of research going on that we draw on. And of course, the Anne Rowling Neurology, um, Re Regenerative Neurology Clinic down at the Royal Infirmary that's just about to get going is it's just a wonderful opportunity. And I just think, what a privilege to be here and have this. And also, where is Alan? Alan, your amazing research that just uh, is just starting up, where they, now, you could correct me if I get this wrong, they're going to put spy sensors into tumours that are being treated with radiotherapy so that they can identify areas of resistance to the radiotherapy due to hypoxia. And we will be able also to measure the cancer cell kill. Now this is amazing. And what is wonderful, because um, Professor Alan Murray, good friend, colleague, and father of one of our former students, and a new grandfather to the same former student. And, uh, 
and it, this is a, a multidisciplinary team research. It's got science and engineering, medicines and veterinary medicine, and the social sciences. And I just think this is brilliant, and he knows I do. So, so there are many other examples, but of course there is research excellence close to home. Amazing research going on in the School of Health and in nursing studies. The critical care research, the dementia research, the emotions research that Pam Smith, Professor Pam Smith, has brought us all into in such a, a fascinating way is all close to home. So it is a privilege to be surrounded by such research excellence. And I wanted just to tie it into the university's mission statement because this is what we are all trying to do to provide the highest quality learning and teaching environment for the greater well-being of our students. And I love the way this statement says well-being of our students, not, you know, academics, but well-being. And to produce graduates fully equipped to achieve the highest personal and professional standards. I think we have so much to be grateful for with the long history that we have of Edinburgh University. But we have to always be looking forward. But I think it was Churchill who said, the further back you look, the further forward you can see. And I think Edinburgh University gives us that. But now I have to move to the pains of my title. And passions are often linked with pains. And there have been setbacks and struggles, as there in is, in, is in everyone's career. And there was a time when my passion to teach clinically did not seem to go with the flow of the tide and the current thinking. And it was sometimes a struggle to keep to what I believed in when perhaps the current culture did not seem to support it. And it's at times when the passions are closely linked to some, some pains and there are setbacks and struggles that I want to thank all my wonderful friends and my family and my God family who are always there for me when perhaps sometimes my passions perhaps ran ahead of themselves or didn't go with the flow of the tide. Um, friends are very important. And then the other pains, anyone who chooses to go into the healthcare professions, medicine and here of course nursing, has to engage with the inherent stress and emotional investment in caring. Um, and the suffering and the courage of the patients that we see most days can cause great stress. And Helen might remember this from our publication way back in the 90s. Many occupations and lifestyles can be described as stressful, but those working in the caring professions continually exposed to human suffering are arguably at greater risk of stress-related problems. And what we try to foster in our students and in their learning is that ability for a degree of empathy and sympathy. I'm a great fan of sympathy. But to cope with the inherent stress of the suffering of others by transforming it into positivity to get a truly healing relationship with their patients. And this concept of the wounded healer does not mean that every healthcare professional must themselves have been a patient. It means that you have to develop that empathy to understand the insider's view of the suffering of ill health and <coughs> sometimes the suffering of the treatments alongside the ill health. However, I did used to say to students, you know, to be a good nurse, you really have to be a patient once every five years. And Alison remembers this. And then to my horror, I was suddenly a patient and I didn't like my own advice. Um, but, I, but the advice still held. When you are a patient, you do see the world from a very different perspective. And when in the short time I was a patient, I did see it differently and it taught me such lessons. Competency is a given. Patients should not have to question the competency of healthcare professionals. But what they do notice are the little things, the extra things, the going the extra mile, the communication skills, the pat on the shoulder as you're going past on a very busy day. They make the difference. And by being a patient occasionally, it reminds you of what's important. And it's quite salutary to realize how you do begin to lose it again and take a more professional view. And you have to stop and say to yourself, hang on a minute, what really is important? So my argument here is 
that there is the pains of working with human suffering, but that if you are equipped, you can cope with it and transform it into a, a really, truly healing relationship, which is a positive one with patients. However, what makes this difficult, in my view, is the lack of resources to give optimal alleviation of suffering, the problem with staffing levels and norms that really do undermine all that passion to give the best possible care. And this is a real concern because nurses desperately want to give the best care, but if they're constantly frustrated by poor staffing levels and lack of resources, eventually that ability to care begins to be eroded and they give up the struggle to try and maintain their standards. And it is good to see that the staffing levels are perhaps being recognised as a key feature, not a too simplistic an argument, but a key feature in problems in care standards. And so that turns rather sadly to the tarnished image of nursing that we are currently experiencing. But we will rise above it. And why? Is compassion lost? I don't believe it. What has happened to the status of essential care in nurse education? This is a question that is thrown through the media uh, more than once in recent months. Has university education for nurses delivered on its promise? We all argue that we must be fit for purpose. Are we really doing this? Are we really matching the needs of the patients that are going to be in front of us in the years to come? And they may be ourselves. Are we really taking the nurses of the future where they need to be for patient and carer expectations in the 21st century? Now, these are difficult questions, but we have to be brave enough and fearless enough to address them and not lose sight of the fact that nursing is still, as Florence Nightingale said, the finest of fine arts. And so we move on to professional pain. And this is just about public confidence. And arguably, public confidence in the profession is sustained when its expectations are, or are perceived to be, in harmony with the professional culture and the actual performance. On the other hand, and perhaps what we are seeing, is public confidence being undermined when a significant gap appears to be between the general expectation and performance. Are the public, and we're all the public, and we're all potential patients, are we having too great an expectation on our healthcare professionals, on the health service in general? But we know that we have this professional pain of this perceived gap now, rather than the harmony. And then, sadly, the Francis inquiry, which I would love not to have had to be addressed, but it has to be. Robert Francis, QC, whose name will always live with nursing now, and medicine and other healthcare professionals, described the Mid Staffordshire inquiry that you all know about, doesn't matter whether you're in the healthcare professions, it has bombarded the media for months now. A story of appalling and unnecessary suffering of hundreds of people. They were failed by a system which ignored the warning signs and put corporate self-interest, corporate self-interest, what could be further removed from care, and cost control ahead of patients and their safety. The normalisation of deviance, dreadful expression, but it means that as care standards were eroded and fell, that became the new normal. And then people forgot and didn't notice that what was really unacceptable but was seen every day was perhaps normal now. And when I teach students about end-of-life care and death, and the reality of that, which is hard for students. I often use the quote from La Rochefoucauld that said, neither the sun nor death can be looked on with a steady eye. And I felt the same about the Francis inquiry. I could not look at it with a steady eye. And so, Robert Francis is one of his, we know he had 290 recommendations, but these are some. We need a patient-centred culture, no tolerance of non-compliance with fundamental standards, openness and the transparency, candour to patients, strong cultural leadership and caring, compassionate nursing and useful and accurate information about services. Sorry. Uh, and what distresses me about that is that the healthcare professionals needed to be told this by the judiciary, by a QC, and that I find a little embarrassing and saddening. 
the Francis report is truly dreadful, but we also know and we also have to be aware that recent history can demonstrate an endless stream of inactivated reports and reviews to ensure, <laughs> as we hear on the news, this never happens again. And again, calling on Florence Nightingale, who said reports are not self-executive. It's no good just having reports. We have to do something with them. And the government's key early priority following the Francis inquiry is patients first and foremost. <coughs> Should we need to be told this? So I don't find that reassuring. I find it sad. But if they will act on it, so much the better. But it's a shame that it needed to be said. And there is a picture of Florence Nightingale in her later life. And just looking at that photograph, there she is. She took to her bed in her later years and stayed there for about 30 years, I believe. And there she is with her quilts and her shawl and that look of contentment, but knowingness on her face. She looks so well cared for and a nice vase of flowers. And to me, that is the epitome of being well cared for in later life. And I just love that photograph. And then moving on with professional pains, we move on to consider the Willis Report, which was really looking at quality and compassion in nursing education and came out before the Francis Inquiry. But as you all appreciate, the Francis Inquiry was known about and known it was coming well before. So the Willis Report had nurse education in a bit of trepidation as to what it might say about the, the quality of nurse education in the 21st century. And did these reports of poor nursing care imply that the quality of initial nursing education was to be at fault? However, although there is much to learn from the Willis Report, it did say the following. It found no major shortcomings in nurse education, and I genuinely don't think there are major shortcomings in nurse education that could be held di directly responsible for the poor practice or the perceived decline in nursing standards or standards of care. Nor did it find any evidence that degree level registration was damaging to patient care. On the contrary, graduate nurses have played and will continue to play a key role in driving up standards and preparing a nurse nursing workforce fit for the future. If that is the case, what goes wrong? Something must go wrong from the bright-eyed, bushy-tailed, enthusiastic, caring new registrant that 10, 15, 20 years later, you're reading about appalling failures in care. What is happening? <coughs> but in terms of education, um, we cannot be complacent. Getting that report from the, that account in the Willis report could have made us say, oh, well, it's nothing to do with us. We're doing a wonderful job. You cannot be complacent. And indeed, Phil Derbyshire and McKenna uh, argue that nursing education needs to do its own critical thinking that we value so much in our students so that we do need to look at our own houses and see what we are doing and how we can improve it. And the fact that it hasn't been seen to be directly related to the Mid-Staffordshire appalling situation, we cannot be complacent. And indeed, the Willis Report does question the core purpose of nurse education. Is it to prepare nurses to nurse patients, which some would say, isn't that obvious? Or is it to manage care being delivered by others? not necessarily giving the care themselves? Or is it both? And these are questions we have to think about because government initiatives may suggest one way and the nursing profession particularly may prefer another. So pains or challenges. We have real challenges in the 21st century. Very few of us need to be told about the demographic and epidemiological reality of the patient population. We have an aging population. We have a huge increase in chronic illness. But in a way, we should be pleased about that because many former life-limiting disorders are now long-term chronic illness so that people can live longer, but now with a chronic illness. But we must match our nursing skills and knowledge against this. We have to think about the consequences of the amazing advances and changes in knowledge and technology. We can do so much more for patients than when I was a student. The amazing investigatory techniques, the amazing treatments, the amazing surgical things they can do. But necessarily, 
we only have finite time and do all these amazing advances squeeze out from the agenda some of the essential skills of care hard to know they should not be mutually exclusive and then we have to think about the different attributes and qualities we might need in today's nursing are the nurses we want for tomorrow the same sort of nurse that we've had in the past and the status quo must always be challenged to at least reassure ourselves that we are still doing the right things and we have to recognize the increasing complexity of care and the reality of burnout, which I alluded to earlier, that nurses who struggle to give the best care against the odds again and again and again, day after week after month after year, will eventually give up the struggle and become helpless, hopeless and heartless, as Seligman put it. And so I think it's very important that we care for those who care. How can nurses be expected to be caring if they perceive that they are not being cared about themselves? And it was Ian McLaren who said he was a theology graduate from Edinburgh in the 19th century and a minister and author. And although this is misattributed to Plato, he said, be kind for everyone you meet is fighting a hard battle. And I feel that for nurses. So you need to be kind, such a simple thing. And then resources, 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 but numbers matter. And it was Howard Catton, head of policy in the RCN, who said the obvious. There is a critical point below which you are virtually guaranteed poor care. And we have to take that on board. And then to turn now briefly to our nurse leaders. In December 2012, the Chief Nursing Officer for England, Jane Cummings, launched a vision and a strategy in which she said, this will change the way we work transform the care of our patients and ensure we deliver a culture of compassionate care. Well, all I can say is it must be so and reports are not self-executive. And I would like to turn to Dame Cicely Saunders, credited with founding the modern hospice movement, because I think she sums it up when she said, you matter because you are you and you matter to the last moment of your life. And she was such an inspirational woman, both for medicine and for nursing, and of course, for hospice care. So pains or educational challenges. And again, in Scotland, the chief nursing officer, Ros Moore, had already launched the review of nursing and midwifery education. And she said, this is to ensure a good quality education system that will create best practitioners that we can for Scotland and that are fit for the future. And again, it must be so. This report has been uh, delayed in coming out because of the, the Francis inquiry and other considerations, but this will be very influential and we must look to it closely to see if we are on the right track with our nursing education for Scotland. So lastly, to move on from pains to purpose. Um, our education system must produce nurses who have both intellect and compassion, not one or the other. And I could have just said that, and that would have been my answer to all the criticisms. You need both. In nursing studies within the School of Health, I think we are proud of our nurses that pass through our hands, whether they are pre-registration learners of the art and science of care or postgraduate qualified nurses aspiring to go yet further and do yet more. And as, at this point, I would just like to say again from the bottom of my heart, my sincere thanks to everyone in nursing studies over the years I have been in the department and then the subject area, whether they are old, old colleagues and friends, or the ones that I've met only in the last two or three years. All my colleagues mean a great deal to me, and we learn from each other. And as our college registrar, Frank Gribben, said last week, we are small, but we are perfectly formed. And, and also, I have particular people to thank in nursing studies. As I said, Annie Ouchel was particularly influential, and Professor Alison Tierney in nursing studies, a great inspiration and role model for me. Um, more recently, I would like to, to acknowledge Pam Smith, Professor Pam Smith, who, bless her, came from Surrey University on a secondment and we wouldn't let her go. So she stays with us. 
And I also want to thank people in the School of Health, um, particularly, well, all the colleagues in, in counselling and psychotherapy and clinical psychology. It's wonderful to be in such a vibrant atmosphere and to learn from each other. But I particularly want to thank Professor Liz Bondi, who was such a support and such a star. And also to Charlotte Clark, our current head of school, who has been such an equal support. Um, and I, I worry about thanking people because I know I will leave people out. But I do want to thank all the support staff, as they're called now, the administrators, the secretaries. They, we couldn't exist without them. They do everything for us. I'm looking at Hilary Colley and Lorna Scheel and all, all the people in the School of Health. And you are much valued by me and all my colleagues. Um, I'm sure I've forgotten people I want to thank, but I thank you all. So just to move on lastly to the purpose, which is the primacy of care. And this was a term coined, coined by Benner, um, but it's a wonderful expression. Um, students of nursing are my challenge and my business. And I know I'm not alone. And sometimes I worry as I stand up here saying what I'm saying, because I know many of my colleagues could just stand beside me and be saying exactly the same thing. The essential skills of care and compassion are the priority. They have a complexity of their own, and I think that's important. But nursing demands intellect and sophisticated critical thinking and research to ensure the optimal clinical decisions our patients expect. And that is so important to realise that. It is all, in my view, fundamentally about making good decisions for our patients. And I look to Graham Nimmo, who's an expert on clinical decision making, and again has taught me a great deal, as has Susan, his wife, beside him, in anaesthesia. Um, but we have to recognise that this is not at the expense of remembering the little things that matter so much. I expect our students to be able to talk in depth about the pathophysiology of a hemorrhagic stroke or chronic pancreatitis or even septic shock, which they don't like, um, but also to remember how many sugars that patient would like in their tea, what relatives they have, who is visiting, and what their family life is like. It, they are not mutually exclusive. They must be able to do both. And when I'm working with them on the wards and spending time with them, I will move from tell me about this drug and how does it work and why is this patient having it to who is the visitor sitting beside them and what are you doing to help and can you go and see what's going on, whatever it might be. So you can move through the range of skills and knowledge the nurses need to have. And then it, placement based experiential one to one learning is fundamental and we owe so much to the service mentors that look after our students 24 seven. We just pop in now and again. But it is 50% of our undergraduate programme, for which, for me, it is a passion and a privilege to be a part. So lastly, fit for the future. So how should nurses of the future be selected? Should we be selecting for emotional intelligence? Should we recruit for caring and compassion, for people that are fine-tuned to the feelings of others, who have emotional fluency, emotional literacy? Is this a trait or is this something that can be learnt or is it both? But we have to consider these things. Should we recruit for dynamic resilience? Yes, you have to be tough in this difficult world we live in and the economic situations that we exist in have to be addressed. They can't be ignored. So we need to have resilience, but we need to be dynamic with it. And then cerebral muscle, which I think is a nice expression. And, uh, Professor Uta Frith, who some of you may know, does this amazing work on autism. And she was actually on Desert Island Discs a few weeks ago, and I'm always telling the students to listen to Radio 4, and they pay no attention. <laughs> but she said, in her metaphor of the brain, is that of a garden that is full of the most interesting different things that have to be cultivated and constantly checked. And I just think that is nice. And then... I alluded at the beginning to this issue of student satisfaction and we do have our national student survey and we are looking always to ensure ultimate satisfaction of the students but satisfaction is a difficult word and I'm very much with Professor Mary Beard of Cambridge University 
What are we about? We do not really want our students to be satisfied. We want them to be questioning, to be challenging, to be poking at the status quo, to be looking at new ways of doing things. So perhaps we want our students to be satisfied with dissatisfaction and satisfied that everything is a challenge and everything is there to be questioned. So it's not that the National Student Survey isn't important in terms of satisfaction, but we need to be careful that we're not looking to encourage complacency because we want them to be always pushing the envelope, which they do in the research here at Edinburgh University. And then leadership. Leadership permeates everything, and we are all our own leaders, or whatever the expression is. But it is an enigmatic and complex quality. And a little while ago, um, the Inogen Research Centre for Economics and Social Research um, was celebrating its 10th anniversary. And our principal, Professor Sir Timothy O'Shea, described leadership in these terms. Vision, intelligence, persistence, charm and cunning. And I thought it was delicious. Um, and, and it was uh, very much contributed to the amazing success that um, Professor Pam Smith knows about only too well. Um, and then wisdom and judgment. We cannot, as leaders or in leadership roles, be hiding behind processes. And then to recognize that leadership is not about elitism. There was an article recently about something about the killer elite in nursing, which was slightly disturbing. But we should be, in leadership, should be enabling, egalitarian and generous. And it should encourage the adventure of pursuing new knowledge, new research, new findings, new skills. So leadership is something we have to think about. And to realize that anyone involved in leadership and teamwork must be able to make an honest appraisal of their own strengths, their own weaknesses, their leadership style, and they must know and understand the team they're leading. That almost takes me back to my lacrosse days. Um, and then shared goals of care as, as part of purpose and fit for the future. One of the things that we are very proud of, and I look to Jenny Tocker for this, is our peer-assisted learning program. Jenny, where are you? There you are. Um, for several years now, we have had a means whereby senior medical and nursing students have taught junior medical and nursing students. And this has been an amazing thing to see. And it doesn't really matter what the content knowledge is. It is watching medical students and nursing students learn and work and collaborate and learn about each other's worlds and to be complementary about their roles with the shared common goal of the outcomes we want for our patients. And we hope to move forward with more interdisciplinary learning, particularly with our medical colleagues, for the medical students and the nursing students. And at present, we are doing some simulation learning, which the students seem to love and enjoy. It's very challenging. Nothing replaces learning with the patient, but simulated learning can complement it and supplement it. Um, and then always innovation, always innovation, but evaluated innovation. Innovation may not always be right. New ideas may be surprisingly exciting, but may then prove to be a false dawn. So you must evaluate innovation. And, and Blue Sky's thinking is always to be encouraged, I think. But then I love this quote from Patrick Geddes, who is part of Edinburgh uh, Matrix. He was at Edinburgh University for a while. He was a scientist, an educator, a town planner. He was someone who was described as interest could not be categorized. But he said, creando pensamos, vivendo decimus, by creating we think, by living we learn. And so the message for me is simple. By upholding nursing as a caring but also an academic discipline, our aim in nursing at Edinburgh University is to produce the best, to be the best, both in the reality of an arguably under-resourced and over-committed NHS, or in whatever other part of the world our wonderful graduates take their knowledge, skills, and passions to be extraordinary. And that is really where I'd like to leave it and to thank you all from the bottom of my heart for listening to me for a little bit too long. Um, but thank you all very much indeed.
Thank you so much, Tonks. I think that gave us a very clear insight into why the college, well, the school, the college, and the university promotions committees w were so keen to recognise that level of passion, <laughs> um, which you told us about. And I think one of the things that I find most interesting in a time when there's lots of talk in universities about the tensions between teaching and research and knowledge exchange and working with practice is that in someone like yourself and in your work, we can see that they, they are a tension in terms of the amount of time we have to give and the, the pulls on our time. But actually, um, they're, ver they're very synergistic. And it, it is about the link between the teaching, the research, and the work with practice. It's not about any one of those being privileged. So let's go outside now and have a, have a glass of wine and a celebration with Tonks. But many congratulations. This production is brought to you by the University of Edinburgh.